What is a body wave? We have not found waves, not yet. You have to wait. For today, if we are lucky, we are going to find body waves. For surface waves, you have to wait until for Wednesday, because we will need boundary conditions. But for the moment, no waves. What we have is this. But there is a distinction here to be made between body forces, F, and tractions, elastic forces, but are in C. <coughs> OK, so from statics to dynamics, thanks to Hooke's law. Yes? Uh, but uh, is there a condition for a wave to go be beyond its elastic limit? We are going to have, I think, about elastic waves. What we are going to discuss today will be, in a few slides, elastic waves. Okay. <coughs> but if you want to go beyond elastic waves, you can do a couple of things. But we are not going to do that. What you can do is to take into consideration deformations that are not small. So you have to go back. And when we defined the strain tensor, if you remember, we developed Taylor's, and we truncated it to the first term. If you want to go beyond elasticity, you have to take care about the other terms. But I'm too lazy. Second, <coughs> in a slide that I was hiding, it is this one. You can go beyond pure elasticity. What's happening? Okay, okay. okay. U. U is a vector, <coughs> so three components. So Ux, Uy, Uz, or if you prefer, U, V, W. But if you prefer U1, U2, U3, it's a vector. So we have three equations there. And please do remember the repeated index convention. That means that here we have to rotate j over 1, 2, and 3. What can we do with this equation here? It's not a wave equation, because we have displacement, and we want to hunt for displacement, and stress. OK, as you can imagine, now we have to write stress in terms of strain, and strain in terms of displacement. Maybe we will get something. In the next slide, there is a lot of algebra. No way out. We have to work with vectors and vector operators. No way out. OK, let's take the first equation. It can be written also like that. Um, OK, I will give to you a notice at the end of the slide. And we can write here stress in terms of Deformation, please remember what is theta. It's the divergence of U. It's also the trace of a strain tensor. It's an invariant. If it is positive, it means that the volume is going to be changing. It's changing, bigger, larger, less than zero, OK, shrinking. Zero, no volume change. OK. So the first line is easy. It's Hooke's law. Here we can we are rewriting strains in terms of displacements. Actually, in terms of derivatives of displacement. Here there is a boring convention. I have to say <coughs> it's a little bit messy, but if you give a look to the indexes, there are many that are repeated there. So this is nothing else than the divergence of U. Here there is the rigidity modulus and the other derivatives. OK, so it's time to insert this into the equation, and we have to take derivatives. But wait a second. <coughs> Sorry. For today, we're going to assume that the body, the elastic body that we are considering, is very simple. It's isotropic, lambda mu, and it's homogeneous. Lambda and mu are the same everywhere. So you can take lambda and mu out of the derivative. They are constants. They are defining 
the universe that we are considering. So we take, it, we take them out. So you see this lambda mu are going out. And we are left with this terrible and messy thing there. OK. Some rewriting here. For example, here you see there is the divergence of u. And we can easily notate it with that operator. Let's be divergence. What's next? Here you see that there is a double derivative. OK? And actually, it's nothing else than the Laplacian. It's the generalization of a second derivative in all the direction respect to what we did for sound waves. Good. Then we're going to use a vectorial expression that is very useful. And is, it is letting us to write the Laplacian in terms of the gradient of a divergence minus a curve of a curve. OK, this is. Apparently, it's going to uh, result in a messy operation, but there is an important fact here. But with this rewriting here, here, we can separate two components. You see, there is one that is related to the divergence of you, and the other one that is related to the curve of you. Now, please do remember that the divergence of you is related to volume changes. The curl of you is a vector that is operating in a perpendic perpendicular direction. So it's related to shear. And if you see here, mu is just here. There is only mu with curve. While here, we have lambda and mu. OK. We can call this as Navier equations. It's still a set of equations because mu is a vector. Now, there are many ways, well, let's say, three, at least three ways to solve it or to break it into pieces. We are going to take a shortcut now. There is another possibility that is followed in the textbook that I was suggesting to you, that is using Helmholtz theorem. And there is a slide next about Helmholtz theorem because it's going to be important. Then there is a possible third way to use Fourier representation. But let's wait for it. Now, in the next slide, what we are going to do is to take this equation and to take on one side the curl, on the other side the divergence. Why? Well, because you have to remember another important vectorial property. If you take the curl, of a gradient, you got zero. If you did the divergence of a curl, you got zero. OK. Let's take the divergence of the left and the right term. What's going to happen? Well, in the left side, we will have the divergence of u. That yeah. is theta. That is something related to the volume change. And what is more important, the divergence of this second term here in the right side is going to be zero. So what we're going to have here, you see that there is already divergence, we're going to get this. If you take the divergence, we're going to get this. Now what is this? That's a wave equation. We have a second derivative in time, and we have a second derivative in all the spatial coordinates. It's a wave equation. The solution is a wave function. What is the wave function that is traveling? It's theta. So it's a perturbation that is related to volume changes. It's nothing else than sound, but in the solids. And we know that velocity has to be this one. So you see how lambda mu are entering into the wave velocity. Let's imagine to take a fluid, mu is zero, and we're left with square root of lambda over density, its bulk modulus. So we generalize sound waves, taking into consideration solids. Now, that's why sometimes this is called the acoustic wave 
equation y, it's related to volume changes. Remember that in a solid, if you compress it, you're going to perturb it also laterally. That's why mu is big. What's next? This is called P wave velocity. Now, why P? The next one will be S. Uh, okay, let's wait a second to discuss why it's called P. It will be self-evident now. Because if you take the curl, you're going to get a curl of u here. So it's vector. Remember that the curl of the vector is a vector. And it is operating in a perpendicular direction with respect to u. So it would be, uh, we are going to use Helmholtz's theorem, it would be a transverse perturbation. What's next? Well, here we have the gradient, and the curl of the gradient is zero. Here we have a terrible chain of curl of a curl of a curl. But if we call the curl of u as a phi, it's a vector, please do remember, what we're going to get here is a wave equation like that. So there is something now different. It's something that is changing shape but not volume, because lambda is not there. We're left just with mu. OK, that's called shear wave equation, and it's called S-wave velocity. What about an ideal fluid? It's not there, because you cannot shear. But now we do have it. Now why it's called S? OK, so P and S. You have to know that P and S are coming, the nicknames are coming from Latin, because P stands for prime, or primary, while S stands for secunde, or secondary. Why? Because P are faster. Lambda plus 2 mu and mu. In any case, they are faster. So they arrive first. So P prime. As second. Or if you want, you can imagine as a P wave something that is related to pressure, while S is related to shear. Okay, now we have two waves. Two wave equations. Remember that the first one is describing a perturbation that is related to volume, and it's scalar, because the divergence of U is a scalar. On the other side, we have the curl of u, so it's a vector. And it's slower, related just to rigidity. What can we do with these two perturbations? Well, you can imagine that in an infinite, homogeneous, elastic world, they will start and we, they will go forever, because they are not going to be reflected, reflected, absorbed. You can imagine that a wave function will be a normal progressive wave once you start it. So if you do remember the old writing, we started with this. What have we done? Today, well, we have to take care that we're moving in a 3D world. So please do remember that now we have vectors, because we're moving in space. So the wave number is going to be a vector, not just a scalar along one direction. What's next? Omega and K, if you take the absolute value will be a velocity. Which one? Well, alpha or beta, P or S, with the same structure as we have studied. And please notice that there is no frequency inside the velocity expression. So there is no dispersion. It's very simple. What's next? Well, we have to take care that the solution will also 
be a vector. And what we're going to study now is how the two perturbations are different. Let me tell you that with some dirty job with algebra, we will get something that we can imagine using intuition. P will be related to compression and rarefactions. It will be a longitudinal wave. While S is a transverse wave. How to demonstrate that? Ah, bad news. But if you want some good news. Because another way to solve that equation, what we did was something very dirty. Let's take the divergence, let's take the curve. So we were putting to zero the two different branches. There is another, maybe a little bit more elegant way to solve that equation using Helmut's theorem. They are leading exactly to the same equations. Um, we could spend a course on Helmut's theorem, but we cannot, also because I cannot teach it. But what I can tell you is that it's very powerful. And we are going to use it in the next term when we are going to speak about seismology, fully seismology, and we are going to speak about sources. Uh, let me go back by one second here and here. Now, you should have been asking me, what about F? We were cancelling it. Yes. Also if it is Monday, still I'm busy. Because what we did actually was to neglect it. Why? Because we want to study elastic waves. So if we want to study the vibration of this table here, we will start from the configuration that is describing its equilibrium under gravity. So we are smart enough to put our seismometer or table meter here waiting to be relaxed under gravity, like the spring in the gravity field. Let's wait and let's start from that equilibrium so that gravity is out. Here we are doing the same. Can we do that? Yes, because for solids, elastic forces are much stronger and important than gravity. OK? So if we want to study the mechanical vibration under my knocking of the table, we can simply start from the gravity equilibrium at the beginning, and let's forget about it. This is not fully valid for liquids, because atoms in the liquid, maybe one of the most important restoring forces will be gravity. As you know, when you throw a stone in a pond, the free surface is going to go back to the equilibrium under gravity. But for solids, F can be neglected. Why am I telling you, uh, I'm telling you this? Well, because it's simpler. P waves, S waves, pure elastic. In the second term, we will use F to introduce the source. And we will speak <coughs> about representation theorem. So actually, F is going to be neglected, but in the second term, it will reappear, but not to describe gravity, but to describe, to represent the seismic source. And we will speak about Green's function. But that's in the new year. For today, let's neglect F. OK? So also the Earth, it's under gravity. We are here. It's self-compressed. And we start from that equilibrium. OK? So F is going to enter there. And we are going to use Helmut's theorem at the time to represent the source. For today, Helmut's theorem is used for displacement. What is Helmut saying? 
while he was saying many things, but also this theorem. He's saying that if you have a vector field, in our case, it's displacement. The displacement that is perturbing the stable or the earth, okay? If it is polite, means, and this means that it can be, how to say, under derivatives, and it's fine. Well, we can always separate it into the gradient of a scalar potential plus the curl of a vector potential. You could say, why we should complicate things? For the same reason that we have used before curl and divergence, because it's simplifying things, it's separating things. Now, here there is a, just a brief summary of the proof. Now, the game is, actually the game is a little bit more complicated, but let's imagine that we have U and we have to find the two potentials. So capital Phi and capital Psi. How can we do that? Well, Helmholtz is saying, look, take a very famous equation. that is Laplace equation plus a source term that is called Poisson equation. And let's find the W, the capital W, that is satisfied with this equation with U as the source term. Good. Mathematicians can help us. And that's the solution. Now, now, if you take the same representation as before, and if you write the Laplacian into the gradient of a divergence and the curl of a curl, well, game is over. Because once you solve this, you have U, you can solve this, you take the divergence of W and minus the curl of W. And game is over. That's Helmholtz theorem. Actually, if you use Helmholtz theorem in this expression, with this fashion here, and you insert into the Navier equations the divergence of the potential, uh, pardon, the gradient of the potential, the curl of the potential, you will immediately separate the two branches. And you're going to solve the scalar potential for P waves, you're going to, to solve the curl of capital Psi for S waves. So it's the same. Why we are going to use it? Well, because now we can study, oops, this was supposed to appear before, and also this one, and also this one, sorry for that. Now we can study how the displacement field is done. In which sense? Okay, <coughs> let's take Helmholtz's theorem and we write u in terms of two potentials. Now, this is p-wave potential, and this is s-wave potential, okay? And what you get immediately is that theta, the divergence of u, that is what is propagating as a p-wave, is nothing else than the Laplacian of this. What about psi, that is the curl of u? Well, it's nothing else than the Laplacian of the other potential. So, still the same. And this has no rotation and just volume change. And this has just pure rotation and no volume change. Why can we tell it for this? Because now, and this is important, if you take an harmonic solution of the two potentials, and you can do that because they satisfy the wave equations. So they can be written in this fashion and in this fashion. Pay attention to the first one is a scalar one. The second one is a vector one. Now, given those two potentials, what about the motion that we are carrying? Well, for this one, you have to take the gradient. If you take the gradient of something that has k inside, k is coming out, because it's nothing else than a derivative in three dimensions. So k is out. What does it mean? That the perturbation carried by P waves is parallel to k. So if k is going in one direction, perturbation is going in the same direction. They are longitudinal. Okay? Like sound waves. What about the other one? Well, 
Now, this is the potential. To look at the displacement, we have to take the curve. And taking the curve means a vector product. What does it mean? That the perturbation carried by this is perpendicular to k. So it's a transverse wave. Remember, the most important quantity when you're going to describe the wave is k. Because k, in its full expression, is a vector whose direction is telling us where the wave is going. Its value is giving us also frequency, velocity. So it's telling us which kind of wave system we are looking at. Is this a P wave, or an S wave, or a sound wave, or a light wave? That's K. Then, the displacement carried by K, wavefronts, can be longitudinal in the case of P waves, or transverse in the case of S waves. So as you can see in the first expression, P is parallel to K, longitudinal. In the second expression, S, that is a vector, is perpendicular to K. One important thing to be, no to be noticed here. What about S waves? Okay, they are transverse. They are shearing the body. What about wave polarity? Can we say something? No. What we simply know is that if the perturbation is traveling in the direction, they are acting on a surface that is perpendicular to the direction. We have no necessity to specify the direction. Why? Because what now we are living in an infinite homogeneous body. There is no way to distinguish between different directions in the plane perpendicular to K. But from the end of this lecture, we will change our view. Because we are going to insert the most important boundary condition. Which one? Can you guess? Now, the Earth is not infinite homogeneous. Do you agree with me? It's not. Unfortunately. Or luckily. Because otherwise our seismogram would be very boring. So is the direction of the S wave is uh, only the perpendicular to the key or is it the perpendicular over the plane since there is the cross product? It's, it's acting on a plane perpendicular to K. I cannot imagine. Look, this is K. No, it's not K, but it's K. Let's imagine that K is going like that. The S perturbation is acting on planes perpendicular to K. If you are changing the plane, okay? That's it. But what I was trying to tell you is that it will be time in a few minutes to add an important boundary condition. Because the Earth is not infinite, for example. You could say it's a sphere. Yes, but the spherical nature of the Earth, that is actually more in ellipsoid, a little bit irregular, but let's imagine that's a section of the Earth. Only in the last lecture we will be fully taking care of the sphericity of the Earth. At the beginning, we can imagine to take a section of the Earth that is small, small compared to what? Well, to the radius. 6,371 kilometers, roughly. So if we consider distances that, that are, let's say, meters, few kilometers, 100 kilometers, until 1,000 kilometers, okay, the Earth will be flat. It's not, but it will be flat. And actually, we will have to add also some other boundary conditions like Heterogeneities, the crust, the mantle, the outer core, something like that. Okay, but the first one that we have to take care of is that here 
we have the end of the world. It's not because we have the atmosphere. But <coughs> for pure seismologists, that's the end of the world, or the beginning of the world. So the first condition that we will add will be a free surface. And a free surface seen from beyond. Now, let's imagine that we have a free surface on the top and we are a wave field now. And we have a K going somewhere on that free surface. P waves will are longitudinal, right? So they are going to kick up and down the free surface. What about now the S waves? Well, we will, we will be smart enough to decompose them into a component that is parallel to the surface. What about the other one? Well, it will be perpendicular. To what? To the horizontal one. Now, you have to imagine that K can assume many directions, right? The parallel will be called SH, and H stands for horizontal. Okay? You have to imagine, but I cannot imagine something better than this. What about the other one? It will be perpendicular. It's called SV. V stands for vertical. It's not always vertical. In some cases, yes. But in general, it's not. But then we will discuss about SH and SV. But we need a surface. Otherwise, we have no ways to separate the S component. It just transfers. Okay? But in a few slides, we're going to consider this. So when we want to talk about uh, the Earth about, as a, an isotropic wave? Uh, isotropic. No, it's isotropic. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, but it's it, in some sections of the Earth, an isotropy can be important. Like, for example, at the junction between the deep mantle and the outer core. <coughs> but actually, it can be considered really a sort of a secondary so we're going to consider it isotropic, but not homogeneous. So we will have to take care about the different heterogeneities that we can find from the free surface going down. They can be compositional, they can be rheological, but what is important is that oh, the velocities, lambda mu, will be different. Okay? And this means heterogeneity. And we will try to take care about that in terms of seismic rays and what's going to happen at these interfaces. But please wait for wet to discuss about this. You have another okay. How do we say P is a scalar as it is uh, gradient of some scalar potential? The potential is scalar. Yeah, the potential is the scalar. Potential. And P is a vector. Look, displacement is a vector, okay? Yes. And you can imagine it to be made in the seismic case of two fields, two wave fields. Let's call it P and S. Both, they are vectors. Also because they are part of a displacement that is a vector. But what about the P and the S? The P vector is the gradient of a potential. The potential is a scalar. Yes. So that's a scalar. This is the curl of something. That potential is a vector. Okay? So I'm not referring to the parts, to the different, about the two parts of a displacement because they are vectors. Yes. But they are coming from two potentials. One is called scalar potential. The other one is called vector potential. OK? So that's the difference. And as you can see here, the two potentials can be written in terms of harmonic waves. It's a set of possible solutions, as we did for sound waves, and using Fourier, and so on. Okay? OK, I don't have very nice animations in this case here. Actually, in the, 
Uh, but he's one, but he's nice. Um, but let's first use these static images here. You see on the top, you can imagine an elastic body that is crossed by P wave functions and P wave fields. What's going to happen? Compression and rarefactions. Of course, when they pass, you are going to have also lateral perturbation, lambda mu, lambda plus 2 mu over density. Definitely, they are very similar to sound waves. So what you can do is to measure wavelengths, to measure frequencies, to measure velocities. Please do remember that k, from now on, is a vector, because it can propagate into space. What about S waves? No volume change, but shape, yes, shape is changing. They are pure shear and transverse waves with their web wavelengths, their frequencies, and typical frequencies in seismology. From the lowest one, you will see the lowest one in the final lecture. It's about 54 minutes. It's the free mode S02 until, let's say, 20 hertz. So, when seismology is finishing, acoustic is coming. Of course, you can take higher frequencies in solids, but you, you will go to very small scales, because the typical wavelengths that are of interest for the Earth are hundreds of kilometers, kilometers, maybe up to urban settlements, let's say, some meter. But beyond that, you can use infrasonic studies to very small materials in the lab. So for real seismology, let's say that we're stopping at 10, 20 hertz. OK, typical values. Some typical values. Let's take the first line. Well, let's be good old friend. Sound. If you take water, you have a P wave. It's nothing else than sound wave. The square root of bulk modulus over density. It's 1.5 kilometers per second. It's sound. As whales know very well. It's fast. What is important, it's much faster than gravity wave velocity. And if you want a very rough approximation to gravity waves, Tsunamis included in some of the, let's call them shallow water waves. That's the typical expression. What is G is the acceleration of gravity. What is H is the thickness of the fluid. Let's take an average ocean of four kilometers. This will be, ah, yeah, it's fast, but not fast as sound. That's why we can use sound waves and seismic waves that are much faster trying to start a tsunami warning system. But that's a different topic that we are going to discuss a little bit in the seismology course in the second term. <coughs> okay, please give a look to some materials there that are typical of the Earth, and you will see that P waves are really fast some kilometers per second. Also S waves, but please do remember that S wave is always lower than P wave. And if you take a Poisson solid, lambda is equal to mu, and Vp alpha is the square root of 3 times Vs. That's a very good approximation. Okay. Uh, the final set of slides here are going to touch a very general topic that we can call geometrical spreading. It's typical of every wave system. It's very important for seismic waves as well. Why combine we don't have a shear wave velocity for play? Ah, sorry, because it's very variable. It's not zero. I mean, you see, I put here zero, but it's very can be very variable according to the presence of, for example, some wet solid, so Vs can be, can be largely variable. So I was not putting a reference number there, 
and you see seismic velocities can add according to different conditions different velocities you see the lowest seismic velocity can be considered this one let's say 200 meters per second that's very low typical of sedimentary layers and the lowest velocity is also giving us the lowest wavelength the smallest wavelength uh, let's make a guess initial guess as you know and as you have to remember that is also velocity of the frequency what about typical wavelengths well let's consider one second as a sort of a reference period if you have one second you get immediately that wavelength is of the order of kilometers it's long or the shortest one could be 0.2 kilometers, 200 meters. Well, it's long. If you go to 10 hertz, well, now you get a 20 meters wavelength. Mm, okay, that's the shortest that you can imagine. Still, is very large compared to interatomic distances. That's why we can relax and not to speak about solid state physics when we study seismic waves. Um, and please do remember that typically S waves have wavelengths that are shorter than P waves, of course, because velocity is less. Okay, what to do next? To generalize what we did. And what we're going to do now is just a small taste about spherical geometry that we're going to use in the last lecture of the course when we're going to speak about three modes but for today we need to remember that every wave system a realistic one is not exactly like that play waves are beautiful also because the information is spread over an infinite play they are beautiful but it's a good approximation only when we are far from the source otherwise we have to remember that from the simplest source that you can imagine, like a point source, waves are spreading over spherical wavefronts. What does that mean? That amplitude has to change while time is passing for the conservation of energy. And we will get an important property now. And we are going to speak about geometrical spreading. Now, there is a, a formal way to discuss this and the way that is a little bit more informal I can use this picture here let's imagine that we have a source here and while time is passing wavefront is propagated okay now the same energy that is related to the power of the source remember energy power intensity decibel <clears throat> but power means the amount of energy that can be radiated per time unit okay for example if you're going to buy a lamp you have to decide how many watts it's going to emit what does it mean that when time is passing the wavefront is increasing it's a sphere what is the surface of a sphere Okay, so while time is passing, R is increasing. And the amount of energy has to be the same. So you can imagine that intensity, the amount of energy per unit of time, per unit of area, is getting less. How much? Well, remember that energy is related to the square of the amplitude. For energy to be conserved, since we have an R square here, we have to put an R under. So that the square is going to be constant when the surface is going to increase. Spherical waves decay as one over distance. Full stop. Now, question. And to you it will seem a silly question. 
Let's imagine now that we don't have spherical waves, but cylindrical waves. Um, it's a, usually in electrodynamics, you can study cylindrical waves as EM waves radiated by an infinite wire. Okay? Let's imagine cylindrical waves. If you do the same game here, you understand that now the surface is going to change as R because it's cylinder, right? So cylindrical waves decay as 1 over the square root of R. You could say, who cares? Surface waves that we're going to define maybe on weld will be cylindrical waves. And that's important because they decay in a slower fashion compared to body waves. But still, we have no way to discuss them, but that's important. So what I'm trying to say here is that the wave equation, as you can see <coughs> on the top, that equation is valid in every reference system. Now, if you want to deal with spherical geometry, with spherical boundary conditions, the Laplacian will be a spherical Laplacian. Sorry about that. So it will be a little bit more messy. But it will be easier when we want to treat spherical boundary conditions. If you want to treat cylindrical condition, okay, the Laplacian will be written in cylindrical coordinates. If you don't want to care about spherical geometries or cylindrical geometries, okay, the Laplacian will be a normal Cartesian perpendicular with x, y, and z, typical Laplacian. In any case, the solution, thanks to D'Alembert, it will be a solution like that. Remember that k now is a vector. x is a vector. That one is a scalar product. Omega is frequency, or if you remember, angular velocity. It's not entering into the velocities, but it's giving the time. <coughs> and g is something. OK. Now, if you take plane waves, good for lazy people like myself, well, g, it's enough to go like that. And amplitude has not to change with time. Or you could say, wait a second, there is also some absorption. Yes, second term for an elasticity. But now A is constant. Could be a P wave or an S wave. But that's constant. Now, if you want to be a little bit, OK, this uh, is a recap that is valid for every wave solution, as you know. OK? So K wave number, 2 pi over lambda. Omega is angular frequency, 2 pi over t, and stuff like that. The same. This is a recap for every wave. But for seismic waves, please do remember that k, velocity, and omega are related to p and s velocities. Good. What about energy in this 1D system? Bad news, guys. Because now computations are a little bit more heavy. But please do remember this, because there will be a similar exercise that you're going to receive maybe in WED. Don't worry, it will not be for Friday, but for the next. And the second official homework, it will be coming by, from your textbook. Okay, so it will be about some exercises there. And this part is coming. These slides are coming from Stanley West Session textbook. Okay? Now, just to add a flavor of energies. Let's compute some energy about what? Well, could be kinetic or potential. Why potential? Because now we are perturbing an elastic body, like in the time of Hooke's law. So we are making work against elastic forces that are trying to put the system back. How much it is? Well, <clears throat> Algebra is a little bit more complicated, but you will see that the final expression will be very similar to what we found some time ago. 
For example, let's consider a pure shear wave that is going along the Z direction. For seismology, Z is the most important direction because you can imagine in a flat system that's X and this is Z. And Z is positive downstairs because that's the Earth. X is the, typically the propagation direction, or if you want to go down, it's Z. Remember that omega t minus kz, k now is omega over k giving s wave velocity. It has one component, it's shear, it's going down. Okay, let's compute the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is related to velocity, right? The square of the velocity. Velocity of vibration. So what we have to do over a one wavelength is to take the second derivative with respect to time. Okay? It's not wave velocity, that's vibration velocity. Okay, as you remember, omega squared is coming out, b squared is coming out. What you can compute is, okay, very similar to sound waves, but please remember that now this is a shear wave. Now what about the other energy? You can easily demonstrate that the strain energy is nothing else than the stress with matrix product with a strain. Now, wait a second. Is it okay with units? Let's try to remember the simplest system. Okay. Velocity of vibration was giving out kinetic energy. What about potential energy here? Oh, Hooke's law. Where is coming this? Well, from the force. Stress in terms of elastic constants and strain generalized. What about the units? Well, please do remember that K is a newton over a meter, right? So here, yeah. the units are OK. What about upstairs? If you give a look to that, strain energy is nothing else than a force times a displacement. That's energy. That's work. Work energy is F times dx, and it's giving this. Okay? Units are okay, energy is okay. What about now we generalize to slow? What about stress? Okay, what about strain? No units. Now, if you take a volume, because now we have to take volumes, if you Give it to the units, it's a force over an area times a volume. So it's a force times a displacement. That's okay. That's the work that we are doing to win or to consider elastic forces that are reacting. Easy. It's a matrix problem. So lambda mu will be there, but since we are considering just an S wave, just mu. If you make the algebra, you will get immediately. But as usual, the energy is related to the square of the amplitude. Omega square, kinetic energy average, is equal to potential energy average, and the total is constant. Everything is fine here because we are considering plane waves. Why is we taking dB as dz directly? Pardon? I think we are integrating over a volume. The real integral here is on a wavelength. Okay? So this integral wants to have an average expression over a wavelength of vibration of a wave. But you have to take a volume because the wave is propagated into the volume. And so every time that you do a work here against elastic forces, stresses, 
you have to take care of it, you're perturbing a volume. So the integral here is over a volume of what? Of this strain energy. That's why here you have to put the V, but then you average over a wavelength. Okay. Because you are considering a plane wave that is going along Z, that is deforming this direction. It's a sort of a simple assumption, but it's just to make algebra easy. But the consequence is general. That's why this dV here, this is general for every wave, for every elastic wave. This is the particular case in which you have a plane S wave that is going along Z, so what you're moving in the V is just shear along a wavelength. It's a, in order to simplify expressions. But now, as a final general slide, we have to remember that all the wavefronts actually are coming from a source, like this. So, what if we have to remember that wavefronts are spherical. Okay, you see, if you are far from the source, so that we can forget about it. Okay, plane approximation is fine. But if you want to remember that they are coming from a source, you have to take care about the, speric the sphericity of the wavefronts. What to do next? <laughs> we have to take the Laplacian and the wave equation and to solve it for something that is that has a spherical symmetry. So let's take the Laplacian, the full Laplacian, in spherical coordinates. Now, wave equation is like that. Wait a second, let's try to be smart. Let's try to rewrite this equation into something that we know. If you change the variable, and instead of eta, we define an eta bar in this way, and if you operate this substitution, this equation becomes this. Wait a second, we know that equation. And we know that D'Alembert is giving us solutions. You see, now we have just a second derivative respect to R. So this wave function has to be like that. If you now operate the substitution back, this is the eta that you were looking for. So please remember, spherical waves have to decay with one over distance, the amplitude. So that the energy will decay is 1 over the square of the distance. And if you integrate over a sphere, it's going to give a constant. It's called geometrical spreading. And it is the responsible of, luckily, if I speak here in 200 meters, no one will hear, him, hear me. If I knock this table in some time space, no one will hear. If you throw a, a stone in a pond, okay, sooner or later you will not be able to, distinct, to distinguish the amplitude of the waves because they have spread. It's pure conservation of energy. And as I was telling you, if you're going to consider cylindrical waves, well, they have to decay as one of the square root of r. So this means that a cylindrical wave is decaying, is decaying in a slower fashion compared to body waves. This will have an, an important effect on seismic waveforms, as I hope you will see. Now, what to do in the last 20 minutes? Okay, we have to begin to think. Uh, first, maybe, what we can do is to look at, to see an animation. Maybe we are uh, seismic. There is a very nice website where there are a few. Uh, we're going to study this one later. OK, this was. I hope they are here. OK. Perturbation is related to change in volume. P wave. S wave changing shape. So we generalized in some way sound waves and transverse waves in a string. 
pure shear in the second case, just mu, lambda mu in the other case. Now, what we want to do now is to maybe imagine this beautiful propagation. Let's give a look to it. Okay. Now, what should we do? Imagine to create this beautiful animation here. Please, some suggestions. Now you see, look at the, for example, seismogram that we are getting there. It is very rich with arrivals. Why? Because now, up to now, in an infinite homogeneous elastic body, we have just a P arriving, and later followed by an S, full stop. What should we do? Well, please. Okay, we have to consider some heterogeneities. The most important one is this. This is called CMB, core mental boundary. And thanks to the study of body waves, essentially, it has been found to be liquid. The outer core is liquid. Why no S waves can propagate there? It's a beautiful liquid. And if it is a liquid, that's, for an S-wave, a beautiful free surface. But wait a second, we have also another one, the outer surface. Okay, some P-waves can communicate with sound waves. But density is so different between air and the solid that we can imagine that it is vacuum. So the first thing that we have to do is to consider a free surface and maybe another one and maybe other layers in the middle. We have to introduce heterogeneities, boundary conditions. Now do you remember the good old string? From infinite string we considered a fixed. Hmm. Fixed is beautiful, fixed, fixed, to play guitar. But the earth, hmm, Maybe it's better to consider a string with a free and free end, but you should remember that the formulas are not changing. Just eigenfunctions are changing. Cosine instead of sines, but the rule of the modes is the same. Then you should remember that we introduced a junction between two different strings, a thick one and a thin one. We introduced the term impedance, and we found for, that for sound and for strings it was density times velocity. And we have seen that the amount of energy that is passing through at the time it was a point, now we have surfaces. The amount of energy that is passing through, reflected, uh, refracted or reflected, depends on impedance contrasts. All this different conditions were different boundary conditions. So it's time to introduce some. The bad news is that we have to take care about many things now. Because our topic will be much worse than the one that has to be solved by people studying EM waves. Because EM waves are just transverse. And P waves are just longitudinal. We have to take care of both. Everything is double. Bad news. Good news is that the waveforms that we can create will be very rich of possible conversions between waves. And that's the next topic. Trying to understand how different interfaces will become boundary conditions can generate different arrivals that can be read and may be used to study the interior of the Earth. 
So what we are going to do from now for a couple of lectures is try to put the basis of very simple seismic tomography, but very simple, just to have a general idea about the Earth. And maybe we can, yes, and maybe we can imagine to create these animations here. You will see one at the end of the course that is made by one of the authors <coughs> of your textbook. It will be made, I cannot resist. I'm sorry, I don't know the, the red line uh, is P-Wave and the green one is S-Wave. <sighs> no, but it's too early for this question. Now we are going to build this one. Um, but I hope, I hope you will understand it just now. Uh, wait a second. Seismology. I have some animations here. Just a prequel. Maybe it's here. Maybe. Okay. Uh, I don't have a brand new also. Because this format is too old to be played here. Okay, let me just show to you this. What my session was making, and you will see the animation at the proper time, just in a, in a, few, in a few lectures, what was doing was to use the Earth modes to write progressive waves with the same style as when we studied the string and its modes. You remember Fourier synthesis and theory? I was showing to you that progressive waves in a string can be created summing the modes. Okay, here my session is doing the same to generate as waves inside the Earth. Just a prequel. We will use these animations, maybe just from the mystery. Okay? Just a prequel. But we have to build them first. And we have to understand them. And the first thing to understand is to remember this definition. We applied it at the beginning for the string, then for sound waves. Inertial properties times velocity of propagation is giving something that is called impedance. <clears throat> okay, we're going to find it again also here. And now you should remember this one. This is a recap. Do you remember it? Okay, what should I have been doing here? What we should do to solve this problem? Come on, we did it. I have to consider the wave function for okay. the spin and refract it. And, uh, uh, just use the boundary condition to solve the problem. Okay, which ones? The displacement. One? And the derivative of the displacement. Good. Why the derivative? Because it was the force. Yeah. Okay. Then we made the guess. And we were looking for reflection transmission coefficients. And what we did was to apply the displacement continuity, the stress continuity. Oh, oh. No, it was a force. Bad news. Now we have to do it for stress. <laughs> Displacement at that time was a vector, but we forget it was 1D. Going here, who cares? It's going there. We have not to take care in the string about angles. And what we have found is that reflection transmission coefficients depend on, upon impedance contrasts. Right? This is a recap. And then we discussed also the extreme cases <coughs> in which there was a free end, zero impedance, and a fixed one, infinite impedance. And we found that all the energy was reflected with or without a phase. This is a recap. Now, what should we do for body waves, for seismic waves that are arriving at an interface? Okay, 
Let's imagine this is a K of a seismic wave field. It's arriving. Now, and we have here planes that are presenting the perturbation. They can be shear waves, so we are perpendicular, or P waves, so we are going to create compression and reflections, right? Now, some bad news. We have to take care about the angles. Mm -mm. Because we have many ways to arrive here. Other bad news. Displacement now has three components. Bad news. Force is stress. And now we have to take care, to take care about all the components of stress. Still, they are related to the derivatives of displacement. But we have many because we have strain into different directions and stress into different directions. So actually, the physics to treat heterogeneities inside the Earth and at the surface of the Earth, okay, the physics is the same, but the algebra is much more complicated, also because we have two wave fields. It's a mess. So what we're going to do is to discuss the most important cases, and then I will leave to your imagination all the possible computations. What we have to do is try to understand that every time that a wave field is arriving at an interface that is a discontinuity, part of the energy can be reflected, part could be transmitted, and the angle will be important, as you remember from Snell's law, that maybe you performed in optics. Now, what about Snell's law? Well, in a very simple case, Snell's law is telling that the angles will respect the fact that the ratio between the sine of the angles and the velocity will be constant. So that's why refraction angle is equal to the incidence. Refraction, ah, it will depend on the velocity contrast. Is it slower? Where should I go if it is slower? What about the reflect, refracted ray? Well, I assume that you know Snell's law. So if you know, you can answer. Sine of i over v1 will be sine of r over v2. Now, if v2 is less, sine of r has to be less, and the ray will go towards the normal. If velocity is larger, OK. It's moving to the interface, right? And there will be a point at which the ray will be 90. It is called critical refraction. That will be very important. Why? Because on average, going inside the Earth, on average, velocity is increasing. So that the rays we we'll try to be curved towards the interfaces and to come up again. That's why in the animation that you have seen before, the rays were curved towards the surface at a given point. <coughs> so you see, now we can use the physics that we discussed for the heterogeneous string, but now we have to discuss for the heterogeneous earth vectors, tensors, and angles. So it's much more complicated than optics and acoustics because we have two wave sets and they can be mixed. This is the most important news. Okay, that's the recap. Uh, that's the energy that we discuss and we generalize it. Okay. Okay. Now, maybe it's too late to start this, but I hope that the few words that I've spent 
about this situation here, let's imagine to have a layer of something, of clay, granite, over a layer of something else. What's going to happen there? OK. <coughs> Uh-oh. Ah, because that was not updated. Because Band was changing the website. Let's study about this. OK. Let's spend these final minutes to make a sort of a tutorial about this. What's going to happen here? So let's say that your homework for the next time, it's not official, is to find the proper link, because this is outdated, sorry. What's happening here? Oh my god. This is, has to be updated, so your homework is to look for the updated one and to give a look to it. Okay, what's going to happen here? That was the first step of this animation. I think the refraction angle will be less than 45 degrees. Reflection? Yeah. Now, reflection is always equal to Incidence. Mm -hmm. Refraction. Refraction. It depends. Here you see we are playing with optics. For optics, there is something that is easy because we have a reference speed. Speed of light in vacuum. That's a reference one. And what is your index of refraction is the ratio between velocity in vacuum and velocity in a medium. In seismology, we don't have a reference velocity. Uh, let's say that in some way we have, but not an absolute one. So here in this te terminology, we have that the first index is 1, the second index is 2, so that velocity there is a little bit lower than the light than the other one. could be like air and water. OK. <coughs> Next step. This is the <coughs> explanation of Snell's law using Huygens' principle. What is Huygens saying? Huygens is saying, uh, this is contained in the tutorial that I hope that we don't have to discuss about Snell's law, but from your faces it seems that. Okay, Huygens is giving us a tool to create wavefronts knowing the status of the wavefront at a given time. You can build the wavefront at a given time plus delta t, imagining a set of secondary sources. You compute the radius, and then you create the envelope. It's a sort of an algorithm to build wavefronts. So what we Let's start the next step. You see those points there will be acting that are now on an interface, but you have to imagine it's something that is separating air and a table, air and water, something. So you have to imagine the points that are over this surface to act as secondary sources when they will be hit by the wavefront. Now, what do we notice is that the radius of the circles in the first material are larger than in the second. Why? Because speed is different. So at the same time, those ones are larger than these ones. Now let's imagine to build an envelope. What you will see is that the incident wavefront will be separated into a reflected one and into a refracted one. And the refracted one is a little bit different. It has changed direction. The final step is to imagine the same stuff with rays. And that's the summary. That's as nice. Now, homework for you, not official. 
look for the web, for this animation here, play with it, you can change refraction indexes. Second, study again SNES low. Oh, it's easy. It's bare. Third, think about what a ray is. The ray is here with these arrows, right? A ray does not exist. The waves are wave fronts that are taking perturbation. A ray is a very useful, how to say, visualization of propagation of the wave fronts. And you can imagine them as a direction perpendicular to wave fronts. It's something related to K, but remember that K is a reality, not a ray. Okay? Fourth, try to change this animation here, switching on the refraction indexes. So one and two have to become two and one. You will get a surprise. Let's try. I hope. I don't know. It's running over the interface, right? So actually, you see that the wavefronts now down actually are moving like that with energy that is damped, and actually, it's more concentrated near to the surface. The fifth and last question for you is what is the energy here? Snell's law is not telling us nothing. Oh, that's a dirty trick. You have to look for the side first. <laughs> okay, um, let's think about this. Snell's law, it's beautiful and useful and powerful, but just it's telling us just trajectories, not amplitudes. In this animation here, there is no information about amplitudes. How much is refracted, how much is reflected, it's not there. Because actually, Snell's law is only coming from kinetic boundary conditions. If you want, you can derive Snell's law from the continuity of displacement. But as you remember, you have to couple all the information. So, continuity of displacement and continuity of stress compared to the string. Algebra is heavier than in the string. Why? Because we have directions now, not just one. Snells. And amplitude is related to full solution of the boundary conditions. Three components of displacement, six components of stress. We will try to take a shortcut within all these possibilities on the next lecture. And we will just consider just a few examples. And you, what is important for me is that you understand the physics of the boundary conditions. Okay? Then algebra is taking the role, and we will see, we'll give a look at some results. Then we will consider just rays, but please do remember they are nothing else than visualizations of propagation of wavefronts. A wave is a wavefront, not a ray. A ray is a very nice visualization of K, if you want. Okay? So that's your unofficial homework. It's going to take five minutes, okay? And if you want, for the next lecture, so we are stopping here, and this is what we have to do next. Oh, wait a second. Look at these expressions that are valid when a ray is arriving exactly following the normal. So as nice low is easy. No angles there, okay? Look at the expressions of the 
refraction and transmission coefficients. They are exactly those of the string. What we are missing here is direction. But if you stay exactly on the normal, good. We are getting exactly the expressions of the string. But, 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 but. Not entirely the same. I think for the reflection, it's uh, p1 alpha 1 minus p2 alpha 2. What is important actually, it uh, depends on the convention, what is 1 and what is 2. What is important is the difference. If you take a reversal, it will be a reverse or phase, yes. but it depends upon, uh, upon your, how to say, your coordinates. Mm, if you take this as 1 and 2, as far as I remember, it should be like that. But physically, what is important is the difference. Because you can also imagine that now the ray is coming from downstairs and going up, and you will reverse it. So it depends on you. What is important is the difference. And what is important is that there is no difference, no reflection, and everything is transparent. OK, that's the final easy slide because the other ones will be much more messy. So be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. OK, so we're going to speak about the reflection and transmission of seismic rays inside realistic models of Europe. OK, now we can. <laughs> <laughs>